it was a little challenging this week, as you just heard, trying to figure out what passage to preach from. I mean, there's, you don't want to say those are three winners, because there's not any bad ones, but, uh, you know, you got the conversion of Saul, which I started a sermon on on Tuesday, and then uh, ended up kind of crumbling that up. And I'd like for us to, uh, to look at the passage from Revelation. I know you're kind of settling in and getting ready, uh, getting ready for the sermon, um, you know, getting out your word finds and that kind of stuff. But uh, keep your prayer book handy. Uh, if you have the kind of the strings in it, you might want to mark page 87. If you don't have the strings, maybe take your bulletin and stick it in there at page 87. We'll, uh, we'll use that in just a little bit. I want you to imagine for a moment going to tour uh, some huge... I got it? 87. Right. Imagine going to tour some huge, uh, successful business facility or corporation. You drive onto the grounds, you pass through the gates, and the grounds are beautiful, there are trees, there are flowers, and there's a, a man there to guide you, and he takes you around the facilities, he takes you to a building where there are hundreds of workers, and they're producing all the goods that this company makes, he takes you to a few other places, eventually you come up to a big multi-story building. And he takes you inside there and starts to point things out. Uh, there's the marketing department, that is sales, there's accounting, the this is legal. And then you get on an elevator and it takes you up to the top floor. And when you get there, the door opens and you see a big, huge, expansive lobby. And there are high ceilings, there are expensive paintings on the wall. And your guide says, this is the center of it all. Right? These are the offices of the CFO, the CEO, and the big office there in the corner is the office of the owner himself. These are the people who are in charge. This is where all the decisions are made that run the rest of the company. So as I said, I'd like for us to look at our epistle lesson in Revelation 5. But before we do that, we need to look at the chapter that comes just before. Because in that chapter, John sees not an elevator door, but he sees a door standing open in heaven. When you hear that, you might think heaven, you know, 10,000 feet or something like that. The door could have been just right there. You know, heaven is kind of another realm. Not so much to do with height. But anyway, John sees this door standing open. And he goes in, and it's the door that leads not into the executive offices, but rather into the throne room of the owner and the maker of all creation. The throne room of God. So when John sees that, what's the first thing? You can read all this in Revelation 4. But what's the first thing that grabs his attention? You can let him tell it in his own words. John said, I saw a throne and someone sitting on it. One sitting on the throne, he said, was as brilliant as gemstones like jasper and carnelian. He said the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow, which would remind us of God's mercy. That mercy made known this merciful promise to Noah, not to destroy the earth with a flood again. That's what the rainbow's about, remember. And around that throne, there were 24 thrones, and elders were sitting on them. These elders were clothed in white, and they had gold crowns on their heads. From out of that throne, John says, there were flashes of lightning, peals, and rumbles of thunder. Burning there in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames, which he says was the Spirit of God in all of its sevenfold fullness. And then in front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, something like crystal. Then around the throne, he says, there were four living creatures. The first was like a lion, which of course would be the king of the wild beasts. The second was like an ox, the great leader of the tamed animals. The third had a human face. We're the greatest creatures, but remember, we are creatures just like the rest. And the fourth was like an eagle, the undisputed king of the birds. John says these beings were all covered with eyes, as if they were keeping watch over God's creation and missing nothing. And probably, you'll forgive me, but in Revelation, I have to use the word probably a lot. Probably these represent the animal creation with humans among them at this point. Again, we're created like the rest of the birds and cattle and wild animals. We're different, but in the sense that we're created, we're the same. But these creatures, these four creatures, John said, they never cease to praise God. And day after day, night after night, he says, they never stop singing this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was and who is and who is to come. Which is a reminder to us 
that all creation worships and glorifies God and does it in its own way. The sun is out there worshiping and glorifying God by being the sun, by blazing in the sky right now. The moon and the stars glorify God by shining in the darkness. Horses give glory to God just by being a horse with all of their strength and speed. The mountains bring glory to God by standing firm in their majesty. The bees bring glory to God by buzzing about and pollinating the flowers. All creation is always <coughs> worshiping the Creator with these words, holy, holy, holy. When I was thinking about that and reading through that this week, it got me kind of fired up. And I thought, you know, it's going to get you kind of fired up. And you're going to be at this point in the sermon, and you're going to say, I just want to worship God. Which is why now you're going to turn to page 87, because there is this great canticle in the prayer book that helps us lead and join with all creation in the worship of God. So it's on page 87. Let's stand and we'll say it responsibly by that verse. Say it heartily, remember you're in the throne room of God. Glorify the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Praise Him, The firmament of His power glorify the Lord. Praise Him, the Glorify the Lord, you angels and all powers of the Lord. Stars of the sky, glorify the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Glorify the Lord, every shower of rain and fall of dew. All winds and fire and heat. Winter and summer, glorify the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Glorify the Lord, O chill and cold. Drops of dew and flesh of sun. Frost and cold, ice and sleet, glorify the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Glorify the Lord, O nights and days. O shining light in the holy dark. Storm clouds and thunderbolts, glorify the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Let the earth glorify the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Glorify the Lord, O mountains and hills and all that grows upon the earth. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Glorify the Lord, O springs of water, seas and streams. O whales and all the and waters. All birds of the air, glorify the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Glorify the Lord, O beasts of the field. And all the flocks and herds. O men and women everywhere, glorify the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Let the people of God glorify the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Glorify the Lord, O priests and servants of the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Glorify the Lord, O spirits and souls of the righteous. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. You that are holy and humble of heart, glorify the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Let us glorify the Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. Let the firmament of His power glorify the Lord. Praise Him, highly exalt Him forever. So that's a taste of creation of glorifying God. Good job on that. You probably thought that would be a good way to end the sermon. But the scene in Revelation 4 continues. And so does the sermon. I'm not going to surprise you again. I know some of you don't like anything out of the ordinary. I'm among you, but you're, you're okay now. Be in here. So John saw that whenever these creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, that these 24 elders would fall down and they would worship the one sitting on the throne. They would lay their crowns before the throne and they would say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. And some scholars have pointed out that creation, as we said, creation worships God simply by being what it is. Mountains are just mountains, horses are just horses. But these elders, these, these probably represent the leaders of the people of God. There's 24 of them, you know, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles most likely. And the difference between people and the rest of creation is that we understand why we worship God. We have the ability to worship God intelligently. So these elders don't just say, holy, holy, holy to the Lord. They say, you deserve to be worshipped. You are worthy. And they say, why? 
You are worthy because you created all things. And by your will they were created and have their being. We read all, we read through those words quickly. We probably read through our psalm quickly this morning. But we need to stop sometimes and think about it. Think of the words of our psalm. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries, locked the oceans in their vast reservoirs. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let everyone stand in awe of Him. For when He spoke, the world began. It appeared at His command. Why is there anything? Because God desired to be. That's why. God said, let it be. And it was. And so John sees these elders and these beings worshiping the Creator, the King of heaven and earth. But if we could imagine John looking in this room and then turning or maybe walking back to the door and looking back to the earth, what would he have seen? He would have seen that God's creation, which had started so gloriously, was a mess. God had made a beautiful world. God had placed human beings in charge of it, but they, we, had trashed it. Human beings were meant to live together in kindness and harmony, but they had grown selfish. They had stolen from each other. They had filled the world with violence, murder, and war. God, as you know, had formed a people to restore His blessing back to the earth, the people of Israel, but they had proven no better than the other nations. Even though they knew better, they knew how to live, how God wanted them to live, they proved unfaithful as well as the rest. And so God was not going to let that go unaddressed. First of all, judgment would start with His own people. They were going to be judged by the Romans. But their culture was even more immoral and brutal than Israel was. What was the owner or the maker or the king going to do? Or was God going to do anything at all? And at this point, John's heart must have leaped. Because he saw something. He saw that in the hand of the one sitting on the throne was a scroll with writing on the inside and the outside. A scroll which would contain the plan and purpose of God. The purpose to judge and destroy all that evil. To rescue His people and to bring healing to the world and restore righteousness and justice, truth and beauty. But the scroll was sealed with seven seals. So it would have to be opened up if its plans were to be made known and carried out. And as John stood there, he heard this mighty angel shout, Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? And it seemed there was silence. Nobody stepped forward. Nobody spoke up. Every single human being has in some way contributed to the mess that God's creation was in. And so as John looked to the right and to the left, behind and before, he saw there was no one. There was no one in heaven or on earth who was worthy to open the scroll. And that this tears began to flow down John's face. He began to weep bitterly because nobody could open the scroll. The plan could not be revealed much less carried out. But then John looked and he saw standing before him one of those 24 elders. And he looked down and said to John, stop, stop me. And he pointed and he said, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir of David's throne, he has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. And John looked up and he turned his head to see this lion he saw a lamb. A lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. But it was standing. And that's the challenge with this kind of literature. The challenge you try to describe a dream to somebody else. You go, I, I, it's hard to put into words. Sir. I looked to see a lion. I saw a lamb. The lamb had been slaughtered, but it wasn't dead. The lamb was slain and standing. Standing between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. This lamb had seven horns, which means he was all-powerful. 
He had seven eyes which see all and represent the seven spoke, sevenfold spirit of God that goes into every part of the earth. And this lamb approached the one sitting on the throne. And he reached out and he took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took that scroll, all heaven broke loose. The four living creatures, the 24 elders, all fell down before this lamb. Each one of them had a harp, and they had gold bowls full of incense, which John says are the prayers of God's people, the prayers of the saints. And the creatures and the elders started to sing a new song. And they sang, You are worthy to take the scroll, to break its seals and open it, for you were slain. And your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language, people, and nation. You have caused them to become a kingdom of priests to our God. And they will reign on the earth. What must that song have sounded like? There was more. John said, then I looked again. And I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne. And of the living creatures and the elders. And they sang a mighty chorus. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then as if you can imagine that, John says, and then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and they all sang, blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures thundered, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down on the ground and worshipped. It is the Lamb who was worthy to open the scroll. And during this Easter time, we remember that it is through the crucified and risen Christ that the purposes of God would be accomplished in the world. If we were to go on in the book of Revelation, and I know there's an awful lot of discussion about this, but most likely we see that the Jerusalem that had rejected the Messiah, that city would be judged. But then also the immoral Roman economy and that Roman war machine, that would also be judged. There are an awful lot of people that believe that's mainly what the book of Revelation is about. Again, that's up for discussion, but it means at least that, if not more. The kingdoms of this world would become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. As we said, at least some, maybe most of these things have already happened. But the story goes on in the book of Revelation. And when we come to the end of that story, we see that eventually the one who deceives humanity in the first place, the Satan himself, he will be destroyed. Even death will be destroyed. There will be no more seed from which any evil beast might emerge. God himself, the one sitting on the throne, will wipe away every tear from the faces of his people. He will make all things new. And God will be all in all. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. In light of all that, here's the three or four sentence conclusion. This morning we come, why? We come, our, we come this morning to join our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven and sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We come to say worthy is the money. We come to say blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you are watching from home today and unable to receive the body of Christ in person, please join with us in the following prayer. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people gathered around every altar of your church, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Thank you for watching the broadcast today. 
We hope you will visit the campus of the Church of the Resurrection and take advantage of the many ministries available to you and your family. Until next week, may God richly bless you and keep you.